The classical Greek world saw something of a political reboot after the end of the Peloponnesian War. The 5th century, at least once the Persian threat was on the retreat, had largely been a bipolar world, divided between Athens and Sparta. The defeat of Athens led to neither a clear era of preeminence for Sparta, nor the freedom and autonomy that Sparta had promised. In this new multipolar world, Thebes and Thessaly would rise to greatness. Sparta would squander both its hard-won hegemony and even its status as a great power, while Athens, far from being destroyed at the war's end, would recover and compete for power with its neighbors for decades. In the end, the lack of a major, stable hegemon in central or southern Greece would allow Macedon to develop into a great power capable not just of threatening Greek autonomy, but able to pose an existential threat to Persia. One of the most important developments of the 4th century BCE was the normalization of combined arms tactics and the growing role of professional soldiers in the Greek world. In such a setting, political entities with greater material resources were bound to dominate their peers. The material transformation of Greek forces into flexible, skilled military machines ultimately enabled the conquest of Alexander the Great and the creation of the Hellenistic kingdoms which followed his early demise. As soon as the Peloponnesian War was over, the Spartans dismantled the Athenian long walls while flute girls played a tune to celebrate the war's end. Soon thereafter, Sparta chose 30 men to be the new government of oligarchic Athens. These 30 men were Athenians who were inclined toward oligarchy and were laconophiles, that is to say men who loved Sparta. What Sparta most likely did not bank on is that these 30 men would not be content with having full power, but would rather go and try to eliminate everyone who had ever opposed or offended them in any way. The 30 would quickly earn the moniker 30 Tyrants, led by Critias, who would develop such a reputation for savagery that his nephew Plato would have to abandon any pretenses of a political career because his family connections would have been fatal. Critias and his colleagues continued to hunt down Athenians who had supported the Democratia, and they tried to enlist the support of other citizens in order to get people's hands bloody. They also tried to limit the government to a small number of a few thousand landowners. This movement became fairly unpopular, and this led to an opening. Athens was still exhausted after 27 years of war. However, there was one former general who was a dedicated Democrat, Thrasybulus. He had won a number of battles in the Ionian War, and he would now lead a desperate struggle to try to restore the Democratia and oppose the crimes of the Thirty. He led a ragtag band of only about 70 men to Phule, a position near Piraeus. There he defeated a much larger and superior force from Athens. After that, he continued to gather more followers, some of whom were not even Athenian citizens, and with this ragtag band, he even gained control of Piraeus. At this point, Sparta took notice and decided to intervene on behalf of the Thirty. Lysander, who had been the general who defeated Athens, was especially intent upon crushing Thrasybulus and protecting the regime that he had established. So as he was moving in to uphold the settlement that he had been responsible for making, King Pausanias then arrived and decided that a more important priority than keeping Athens oligarchic was keeping Lysander's ego in check. And so effectively he negotiated a peace which allowed the remaining 30 to move out to Eleusis, where they would be independent, while Democratia would be restored at Athens. And this was effectively, like I said, just to cut, uh, cut Lysander down a peg. In the immediate aftermath of this, it looked like Sparta had done something fairly wise. What they had done is they had allowed Athens to live under what they would think of as their ancestral constitution, while also still being divided. Attica was not united at this point, and Athens was so greatly weakened by the Peloponnesian War that it would hardly pose a threat. Also, they had gained some gratitude among the restored Democratia by allowing them to exist in the first place, and not only exist, but keep their ancestral constitution. So, this was not necessarily a bad move, except that Sparta had other issues to worry about, and also other potential enemies. 
So ultimately, this move would backfire, but in the immediate time frame, it was not necessarily a mistake on their part. After the Peloponnesian War, Sparta looked stronger, at least on paper, than it had ever been. It now had a strong fleet, and it controlled many areas outside of the Peloponnese for the first time in its history. However, internally, there was a good deal of rot. Sparta's whole system was based on the maintenance of some 10,000 citizens by keeping up estates of a certain size that could sustain such individuals and their activities. However, Sparta had not been enforcing its land laws, and because of that, the number of people eligible to be full citizens had dropped dramatically. By the year 371, there were only 1,000 citizens, whereas back in around 480, there were about 10,000 citizens. And that's a precipitous drop, which is especially important when you consider that now that Sparta has committed itself to hegemony, it will need more citizens who can serve as officers. So now Sparta has more commitments than ever, and fewer people to fulfill them. Sparta will try to make good on their failure to maintain their land system by creating all kinds of crazy ranks and statuses that denote someone who can act as a citizen but is not technically a citizen, and it just becomes a complicated mess. The works of Paul Cartledge are full of all kinds of neologisms that the Spartans had to come up with to try to justify just failing to do basic land reform and keeping things simple. Also, Sparta's governors and the absence of an Athenian menace as a boogeyman meant that many of Sparta's allies were either angry that they had now been imposed upon by a Spartan governor or a Spartan garrison even, and then the ones who weren't garrisoned were still wondering where the threat was. Why do they need to keep paying money to Sparta? Why do they keep need? Uh, why do they need to? Be loyal to Sparta. What's the threat? Sparta won the war, and they promised freedom and autonomy, so where's it at? Sparta had all kinds of things to potentially worry about now because it had committed itself to this course of action. There was still the threat of a Helot revolt. This had been a problem for Sparta throughout its entire history, and that had not gone away. In 398, there was the conspiracy of Kenadon, who was effectively one of those Spartans who could not attain full citizenship because of not having enough land, he effectively tried to mount a coup of some kind, and the Spartans tried to keep this hush-hush, but it's pretty clear that this disturbed Spartan leadership pretty badly. There was always the perennial threat of Argos. Argos had never been conquered by Sparta, and every 30 years they would try conclusions again. And, to compound the Argive problem, as had been the case in 418, Sparta had to worry about other Greek powers joining with Argos to try to overthrow Spartan power. At this time, their two biggest and most important allies, Thebes and Corinth, were becoming increasingly cold and distant. They were pretty unhappy with how Sparta had handled the war in the late phases, and especially with Sparta's decision not to destroy Athens. So Sparta had a lot to worry about, and they needed a way to keep the other Greeks distracted and loyal. And what they came up with was making war on Persia. During the final phase of the Peloponnesian War, Persia had agreed to fund Sparta's navy on the stipulation that Sparta would allow Persia to reclaim Asia Minor without protest. This had originally been Persian land until the Athenians had conquered it in the early to mid-5th century as they were establishing the Delian League. But as we mentioned, Sparta needed an enemy. Sparta needed a foreign foe that they could get their fellow Greeks to fight against in order to focus on something other than the fact that Sparta had effectively thrown out the window its promise to the Greeks to allow them to be autonomous. So, accordingly, Sparta was looking for a war with Persia on the grounds that they would protect the autonomy of the Greeks of Asia Minor. This was greatly aided by the fact that Persia was in the middle of a civil war. The gentleman who had arranged for Persia to annex Western Asia Minor and give all the money to Sparta was Cyrus the Younger, the second son of the king during the late Persian War, who then went on to challenge his brother Artaxerxes II for the throne. This had led to a massive battle at Kunoxa, where 10,000 Greek mercenaries, who were mostly exiles due to the Peloponnesian War, had fought. They then made their way back to Asia Minor 
where they joined up with Agesilaus' army. It was at this point that Agesilaus met the new leader of this mercenary group, Xenophon, and they became best friends. So this gave Agesilaus a big leg up when it came to fighting the Persians because now he had a close friend and advisor who knew them very well. So Agesilaus is a relatively new king of Sparta, still pretty young, and this is how he's going to really prove himself and also keep the Spartan hegemony intact. He managed to win some modest successes, but Sparta ultimately did not have the same kind of resources that Persia had and without the kind of mobility that Persia had, he couldn't possibly counter every move the Persians made. However, the Persian satraps of the West decided that it would be better to get rid of Agesilaus in some way other than fighting him head on, and so they decided to get a little bit creative by thinking about the one thing that they had that Sparta couldn't stop, money. The Persians seemed to have been well aware of the general discontent with Sparta, and so they dispatched envoys with gold to Greece in order to fund a revolt. They found a fertile ground for their gold. Corinth, Thebes, Argos, and Athens all teamed up in order to threaten the Spartan hegemony. At this time, the Athenian general Conon, who had been in exile serving as a Persian admiral, came home with his Persian fleet and gave a bunch of money to his home city to restore the Long Walls while also funding the restoration of the Athenian fleet. So Athens was now back as a power, even if it was still far, far short of what it had once been. Meanwhile, Agesilaus II had to retreat from Asia Minor in order both to save himself and potentially to protect Sparta, as he had a significant portion of the army with him, and the defense of Sparta proper was far more important than holding on to Western Asia Minor. He did have to beat a fairly harrowing retreat, which was somewhat comparable to the retreat of the 10,000, and luckily for him he had Xenophon and a number of the mercenaries who had already been through something like this. Despite the massive threats that he faced in the war, Agesilaus did manage to make it home, somehow, and he was able to defend Sparta. However, this caused the abandonment not only of Asia Minor, but also northern Greece as well. So Sparta would be very much more confined. And if anything, after Agesilaus got home, the Spartans were not really able to break out of the Isthmus of Corinth, and they were effectively trapped in the Peloponnese. Their fleet was also smashed at this time by Conan's Persian fleet. So Sparta had really been taken down quite a bit by the end of the Corinthian War around 388 or so. While the Corinthian War did not go well for Sparta, especially if you look at the map, they ended up winning a good percentage of the battles, and Sparta's power was far from broken. However, Persia decided that it was time to let the war end before Sparta's power was broken because they were more alarmed at how Athens was starting to recover. The newly refounded Athenian fleet was beginning to reclaim islands in the Aegean, and the Persians feared a return to the battle days when the Athenians would prey on their coast and would prove to be a much more sustainable threat than the Spartans had been. And so Persia, under the leadership of Artaxerxes II, decided to impose a peace on the Greeks. And the only thing that they had to do to make this happen was to cease funding the other Greeks and threaten to fund the, per the Spartans again. This peace was now negotiated largely by the Spartan ambassador Antalkidas, so one of the other names of the peace is the Peace of Antalkidas, but it is typically just called the King's Peace of 387. What this allowed for is that the Peloponnesian League, that is the traditional Spartan alliance system, would continue to exist, but all other leagues and alliances were forbidden. The guarantor of this peace was Artaxerxes II himself, and so effectively what he did was confirm the Spartan hegemony, albeit on a reduced basis. Persia was now also able to redeem Asia Minor, so things were restored to what they had been prior to the 470s. Effectively, although Artaxerxes and his brother had literally tried to kill each other, Artaxerxes had fulfilled what his brother had set out to accomplish. The arrangement more or less uh, guaranteed, though, that Sparta and its neighbors would continue to fight, as neither side had really been defeated in the Corinthian War, and neither of them were satisfied. I should also mention at this time that it is a fairly common view 
that the Corinthian War should be thought of as another phase of the Peloponnesian War. I personally disagree with that, but there are some people who have argued that in the past and have made some reasonably decent arguments to that effect. Up until the Peloponnesian War, Greek warfare seems to have been relatively simple. On land, things were mostly just decided by hoplites. Now, it was never fully that simple, but for the most part, you didn't need other troop types to win battles. Once you get to the Peloponnesian War, things start to become much more complicated very quickly. Generals began to experiment with different troop types, and it became evident that you could potentially win battles with more than just hoplites. Well, fast forward to the Corinthian War, and it becomes abundantly apparent that hoplites on their own are not only no longer the only approach, but also aren't viable anymore. So, one of the most iconic battles in the Peloponnesian, or not the Peloponnesian, but the Corinthian War, is where the Spartans have a full regiment of hoplites on the march, probably just on patrol, and then the Athenian general Iphicrates dispatched his peltos against them. And because they were fighting on hilly terrain, the peltos used their mobility to decimate this unit and kill half of it. Peltos, by the way, are men who are lightly armed. They carry javelins, and they rely upon hit-and-run tactics. So they rely upon foot speed and hitting power rather than being able to stay and trade blows using heavy armor. And so, effectively what this announced to the world was that the era of pure hoplite warfare was officially over, and now the future was with combined arms, as modern people would call it. So for an army to be fully functional, you need to have a cavalry unit there to scout to make sure that your flanks are protected. And you also would need light troops to fire missiles and to skirmish some. And then you also need your hoplites there to deliver the killing blow or to organize behind as you regroup. So warfare had become quite a bit more sophisticated and this led to a great deal more professionalization among both soldiers, some of whom were specialists at throwing javelins or shooting bows or what have you. And also, leaders became much more professional. It's during this period that we learn a lot about standard tactics, standard ways to combine troops, standard ways to land men when you're landing from ships in the hostile terrain. So generals became much more practiced at their crafts. This included all the generals of the era. Most of what we know, though, is about the Athenian generals who, by the way, also had to largely fund their own campaigns by this point. So the Athenian generals not only had to do much more complex tasks when it came to running their armies, but they also were responsible for figuring out ways to keep their men paid and fed. Athens and Thebes were both known for innovation. Thebes had a tendency to try to really change up traditional hoplite tactics by going away from the seven-deep tradition. Athens, of course, used a lot of peltost um, and had a lot of amphibious operations that mixed naval and ground forces. Sparta, however, decided to stick very closely to its 5th century traditions. They thought that nothing had really changed, they were still the best, and that their hoplite skill would still carry the day every time. So this is what is going on militarily as the 4th century continues. And also, one of the later developments that will come about mid-century is the development of siege equipment. So, for the first time, by the time we get to around 350 or so, Greek armies can actually meaningfully lay siege to areas and reduce them with siege equipment. To return to Greek politics, there was a new balance of power after the king's peace. Sparta was still the hegemon of the Greek world and still the most powerful single state. However, it no longer had a fleet, and its mastery was far from uncontested. In general, Xenophon tells us that the Greek world was growing stronger. Many of the more minor powers that we haven't really talked about are getting bigger and more viable. Some of the more rural areas of Greece are developing. And so, overall, the power of the Greeks is increasing, while Sparta is relatively stagnant. So, in relative terms, it is growing a bit weaker vis-a-vis -vis its opponents every passing year. And that will be a problem, especially because Sparta is trying not to innovate, whereas their primary opponents are open to innovation and are trying to find ways around 
dealing with Sparta's superior hoplites. One way for Sparta to try to compete in this changing world is to effectively have a high operations tempo, that is to say to go on a lot of operations to try to launch surprise attacks, and to engage in regime change as convenient. One of the most famous incidents of this era occurred in 382 when the Spartans launched a surprise attack on Thebes and imposed a garrison in the Cadmia, which was the Theban equivalent of the Acropolis. They did other things to try to keep their neighbors in check, but ultimately all that they did was to further alienate themselves from their former allies and to make many of their current allies a little bit distrustful as well. So Sparta was hanging on, but only because of mostly underhanded means and through sheer force. But there was not a lot of support for Sparta's hegemony, and of course that in itself would prove to be a problem in time. After a few years, the Thebans were able to expel the Spartan garrison from the Cadmia and to reestablish their home rule. They decided to embrace Democratia and to discard their ancestral constitution of oligarchy. At this time, the Thebans were striving toward restoring their regional hegemony in Boeotia, and Sparta was determined to stop this at all cost. So this was one of the major theaters of operation for Sparta pretty much year in and year out. In 371, the two sides squared off at Leuctra to fight a fairly massive hoplite battle, and in this battle, the Thebans were able to stun the world by taking on the Spartans head-on at a slight numerical disadvantage and winning a decisive victory. What the Thebans did was that they loaded down one of their flanks to make it heavier and overwhelmed part of the Spartan army. The Spartans were still using the traditional seven-deep formation, and they were not prepared for what the Thebans threw at them. So this led to the defeat of Sparta. Several hundred full citizens of Sparta were captured or killed in the battle, and so this is what really highlighted that demographic crisis that had been building for years. After Leuctra, Sparta was so shattered that Agesilaus, who had effectively retired for all practical intents and purposes, had to come out of retirement and work in the field for about 10 more years in order to keep Sparta even semi-afloat. The next year, the Spartans were not able to defend Messenia from a Theban army, and they had to watch while the Thebans liberated the Messenians and the ancestral estates of Sparta were effectively dismantled and restored to the natives. So Sparta's whole economic basis was effectively destroyed, and they couldn't really do anything to stop it. Sparta would never recover from Leuctra. Now, they would attempt to regain their power on many occasions, both in the late Classical and in the Hellenistic period, but all of their attempts ultimately failed. And even though those attempts failed, they did rock the world. So the Spartans were able to make some very impressive attempts, but ultimately they were all failures. So now the Thebans are in charge, but that won't last very long. The Theban hegemony lasted for less than a decade. It began at Leuctra in 371 and ended in another battle at Mantinea in 362. It was so proverbially short that people would often refer to something as a Theban hegemony if they meant to say that it was far too short. For the most part, the reason why the Theban hegemony failed is because no one really wanted them to be in charge. Everyone wanted to be the chief power, and so they decided to resist the Thebans. So the Thebans, during the period of their hegemony, are literally fighting on at least three fronts at any given time, and winning. And this is largely due to the great generalship of Epaminondas and Pelopidas, and also the generally high quality of the Theban armies at this time. So the Thebans, in their last battle at Mantinea, actually prevail over the Spartans, Athenians, and Elians, but it was ultimately a Pyrrhic victory because the last of their great generals dies. Effectively, what happens is not so much that the Theban hegemony was defeated in a battle the way that the Spartan hegemony died at Leuctra, but rather that it just ran out of steam after winning so many victories. They simply couldn't keep up the pace and fell off. Thebes remained a great power, but it was not a hegemonic power anymore. So this is an example of a period of domination that ends with a whimper rather than with a really notable event. Even Mantinea is largely just a courtesy date to 
sort of tack on to the end of this. And after the end of the Theban hegemony, there really wasn't a replacement power. No one would really rise up and become the big kahuna on the Greek scene, at least not until a power in the north would come of age. The power best positioned to step into the void was Athens. Athens had recovered much of its wealth and population by this point. The fleet was back at full strength, or pretty close to it, and Athenian generals were some of the most innovative and talented in the 4th century world. So, what happened? Why were the Athenians not able to reclaim their hegemony at this time? The main reason is that they had founded the Second Athenian League back in 378 in order to create an alliance to hold back Thebes and Persia and Sparta. But it was becoming clear that none of those powers were a threat anymore. Persia was content with what it had, Sparta was not able to get its stuff together, and Thebes had clearly fallen off and was declining. So the Athenian allies no longer wanted to pay tribute, and they felt that it was their right to secede. There was some disagreement when Euboea, the island right next to Athens that contained a great deal of wealth, decided to try to secede. Athens actually fought to try to keep them in line. They lose this war. And so for a few years after 355, Athens is flat broke. But surprisingly, despite losing its league and lacking imperial tribute, Athens was able to recover financially due to a series of excellent uh, administrators who were able to really get Athenian finance on a solid footing, even under reduced circumstances. But the Athenian priorities were mostly keeping up its domestic programs. And so, while the Athenians were still able to afford military operations from time to time, this was not their number one priority. They were largely fed up with getting involved in other people's problems, at least by around 350 or so. And so, the Athenians were the strongest power in central or southern Greece at the time, but they weren't supercharged by any means. So any time that a new power would emerge on the Greek scene, it would be up to Athens to try to contain them. The question was then, could Athens get the job done? Well, in theory, they had the resources to do it, but in practice, it was very hard to actually muster those resources and to find the willpower to fight a war that would necessarily entail a great deal of sacrifice on the part of all the citizens. It's also worth noting that 4th century Athens did not decline at all from 5th century Athens in terms of culture. The Democratia continued to make refinements, and in fact there are no major disturbances in its record, at least after the trial of Socrates in 399, so the Democratia will have no more mass trials of generals or anything like that, it will become very stable. You will have people who review the laws to make sure that everything is legally consistent. So basically things are becoming more stable and secure. And also Athens is a major center of military innovation. This is also the period in Athenian history where you have most of the great philosophers that Athens would produce alive and active. Plato was a native son of Athens. His student Aristotle was from Stagira in the north, but he spent most of his professional career in Athens. Epicurus, the founder of Epicureanism, was a native Athenian, and Zeno, the founder of Stoicism, was a slave at Athens when he founded his school. So Athens is still going strong, it's still putting on plays and uh, doing things of that nature, so we should not think of Athens as being all that reduced from what it had once been. If it is reduced, then it's not reduced by very much. Athens is still strong both militarily and politically, as well as culturally. Due to their strong fleet and the mobility that it afforded them, the Athenians were the ones who would have to deal with any of the rising powers from the north. The first indication that power in the Greek world was shifting north was when Jason of Foray rose to prominence for a few years in the Greek world. Up until that point, Thebes and their northern wars had really managed to hold back the development of the Thessalian leaders, but after Thebes fell off, then Thessaly was able to rise up. Jason of Foray was the most prominent Thessalian leader to emerge, but his reign only lasted for a few years. The real enemy that Athens would face, and the power which would eventually subjugate all of the Greeks, was the Kingdom of Macedon, which is to the north of Thessaly. 
In 359 BCE, a 24-year-old man named Philip II ascended to the throne of Macedon after his older brother had died and his nephew was still far too young to govern. And he, as someone who had lived at Thebes as a young man and studied under both Pelopidas and Epaminondas, was determined to turn Macedon into the power that it had always been destined to be. Philip II not only harnessed the power of the mines in Macedon, but he organized the relatively large manpower pool, and he trained the men to work in a combined arms fashion, using some fairly new and innovative weapons. And so what he ended up producing was the greatest army of antiquity, at least in my opinion, and if not the greatest army of antiquity, then certainly one of them. He built the army that Alexander the Great would later use to conquer the world. By about the year 350, it was pretty apparent that Philip II was on the rise in a real way, and that the only power that stood any chance whatsoever of holding him back was Athens. So this would emerge as the most important rivalry in the late classical period, Macedon versus Athens. However, it was mostly a fairly indirect rivalry, as the Athenians were trying to intervene strategically with their fleet along the coast, while Philip II was fighting head-on against the Illyrians and the Thracians and the Thessalians. The Athenians were also pretty divided politically about how to deal with Philip II. There were some Athenians who actually supported him. They thought that he was doing good work in the north, and there were others who thought that Macedonian kings had this habit of getting assassinated, so why bother addressing the Philip II problem? Most likely one of his nobles will do him in at some point, and with that, Macedon would descend into civil war, and the threat would be removed. But Philip II proved to be more capable than many of his detractors thought. The Athenians in general were also unwilling to commit to fighting major wars, especially wars that did not have a clear purpose, and especially since Philip rarely, if ever, directly aggressed upon the Athenians. Demosthenes was the most outspoken critic of Philip, and he delivered many speeches where he called for Athens to intervene against Philip. But for the most part, the Athenians heeded the advice of other people, people such as Iskines and Demides. Philip was also, we must remember, an excellent diplomat. Not only was he a top-notch general and soldier, but he was really good at convincing people to do what he wanted, and he used marriage alliances like a pro. He was able to marry a number of women and gain access to their family's kingdoms. One of the kingdoms that he established a relationship with was Epirus, a rising power in northwest Greece. So, Philip was the complete package. He only lost one battle in the field in his entire career. He organized the greatest army the world had ever seen up to that point. He built up the economic base of Macedon. He built cities up and he was a top-tier diplomat. So it should come as no surprise that, by and large, this guy was able to outmaneuver Athens at nearly every turn. From at least 350, if not a few years before, Demosthenes had been consistently and loudly calling for a large war against Macedon. It was only in August of 338 when Demosthenes would get his wish as Athens would combine with Thebes to face Philip in a massive land battle at Chironia, which is a small polis in Boeotia. In this battle, Philip II emerged victorious, and with his victory became the undisputed master of the Greek world. This was also the first battle where Alexander would really distinguish himself, as he actually delivered the fatal blow by driving a wedge between the Athenian and Theban contingents and creating a rout. After the battle, Philip II would form the League of Corinth, which was a group of Greek powers dedicated to gaining revenge on Persia for the temples that they had destroyed during the Persian War. He was making preparations to depart for Asia Minor and celebrating a wedding to yet another new wife when he was assassinated for personal matters. Ironically enough, Given how Demosthenes and others had demeaned Philip as a non-Greek and a barbarian for many years, it would be Philip's Macedonians who ultimately would do more than any other Greek power to spread Greek culture 
beyond the boundaries of Greek civilization. The Hellenistic world only exists because of the conquest of the Macedonians and their conscious decision to spread Greek culture to non-Greeks. So in many ways, the army that Philip built would do more to spread Greek culture than any of the philosophers, playwrights, or intellectuals of Athens or any of the other great intellectual centers of the Greek world.